you're listening to the Overfunctioning Leadership Podcast, learning leadership concepts through life experience. Well, hello, friends, to another podcast brought to you by Of Leadership. I'm Alex. I'm John. And I'm Zach. And today we'll be talking about the rip-roaring, really uplifting topic of failure. Wah, wah, wah. Gotta love it. The big F. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. F. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but before we get there, gentlemen, perhaps we should discuss our last podcast, which was with Nick Kohler. And he talked about adulting. Uh, John, what was that about? Well, we had Nick on and enjoyed hearing from him. He talked about his journey as a college student and trying to grow himself up a bit in both professionally and personally in his own family. So if you get a chance to listen to it, I think you'd find it really, really helpful. Great. Great sales pitch. I'll buy. Uh, by the way, John, this is episode number 43, which is whose episode? Well, uh, since the topic is failure, I'm going with a guy who failed to get off the ground. That'd be Brad Doherty, number 43 for the <laughs> Cleveland Cavaliers, seven foot tall and could barely dunk. Brad Doherty. <laughs> who was the, there was another guy for the Cavs a little later on who failed to rebound. I don't know if he could jump either. Uh, Hollins? Lionel Hollins, yes. <laughs> he was seven foot tall, played at 6'2". <laughs> wait, 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 Lionel? No, that's Ryan Hollins. Sorry, <laughs> Lionel Hollins from Sixers days. Sorry, I was like, well, Ryan well, Hollins. And, and yes. He's very closely related to Lionel Richie. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, anyways, mm-hmm. sports. That was a music reference, but yeah, sports. <laughs> okay, so um, bef- to, to get us into the whole failure talk, I'm actually going to share a fable myself. So, you know, get out your lint roller if you've been playing with your dog a lot or your cat. And just kind of clear yourself off and get ready for this fable because here it comes. So um, through my job at work, I've been working with um, students for student council and interviewing people and also leading a, a group called Future Leaders. And within, I don't know, about two weeks, we were interviewing students for student council. And I also had a meeting with Future Leaders. And at Future Leaders, uh, I always ask, what do you guys want to talk about? And I had a student ask, like, making decision makings. Like, how do I make good decisions? And at, we talked for, geez, a good hour and a half, and it all seemed to get back to failure and dealing with failure. What does failure look like? And and this also connects to when we were um, interviewing students for student council And it kind of got, it was weird because it kind of got in the same area too, where they wanted to be put in position, especially with student council, to where they could be in a position where they could fail and learn from failure, um, which I found really interesting. So it all came to a head, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago and it started making me think about what failure was, what are you supposed to do with it and, and, and all of that. And so I bring that to you. And to our listeners about failure because we deal with it a lot. And yeah, so let's go ahead and start here. I'm thinking that we need to probably define what failure is. But before we do that, do you have any questions that clarify my story at all or understanding what I'm what I'm tossing out there? They wanted to know how to fail. Is that in some ways it was almost like in decision making, um, especially for the students I was talking to, it's like one decision's right and one decision's wrong, right? So mm. we've talked about this before in the podcast of having you know, a, one particular outcome in your mind and not allowing for any other outcome. So if you're so dead set on one thing, it can, you know, if something else happens, then that could be deemed as a failure in some ways. And so we talked about that a lot and we'll, we'll wrap back around that, I'm guessing, on this podcast but they wanted to know what to do with that. You know, what what would I do? Like, what does that look like? I have no idea. So if I make this decision, you know, then I can fail. But really, it's just, it wasn't about the decision making in my mind. It was more about what are you going to do when you make the wrong decision? <laughs> you know, like, because you're not always going to make the right one. Um, so there's that, you know, the black and white thinking there with that decision making too. So, Yeah, I'd be curious about how much of the stress that, a young person feels about failure is tied to 
relationship pressure and disappointing a parent, for example, or maybe a teacher or another adult who might feel let down by the decision. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering if the pressure of a failure is a, if there's a component of relationship, just don't want to let somebody down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not that I'm mad at you. It's that I'm disappointed in you. <laughs> Which always feels so much better. <laughs> oh, okay. Just oh, disappointed. Well, sure. okay. I'll go I on could, my way, merry way now. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So, uh, did that clear it up for you, Zach? Yeah. Okay. So, as we go forward here, let's define leadership. I'm mean, not leadership. Let's define failure first. So, when it comes to failure, what what is failure? I know, John, you looked up the. Uh, I, I did. We're, we're having a little bit of difficult time defining failure. So I looked up the dictionary definition and it defined it as lack of success. So I'm not sure we'll have much more success at defining success versus defining failure. Mm-hmm. So it's like failure is the absence of another word that we can't define very well. Well, I mean, can we look at success and just say that that's Success is developed by who? Is that developed by ourselves? Like what we deem as successful? In, in the example you already gave, the relationships, that could be success dependent upon somebody else. So it's almost like you have two, you could have several different layers of success. One, my individual. One, somebody else thinks about me. One, societal. I mean, you could have familial success. There's a lot of different layers here to the success level, right? Yeah, well, looking at this, who, what, where, when, why, how, you know, the, the, the question words. But when you look at them, we don't like giving advice because you're giving someone a how, and -hmm. that how is probably your piece of how you would solve it. And so that's why advice isn't always great, right? But looking at what, who, and why, those questions are interesting as they pertain to failure because when we're, we just said that a big problem with failure is when you define it as two diametrically opposing forces, choices, mm-hmm. this black and white, one's fully right and one's fully wrong. And then you have this who. Are you defining who it is? Is it yourself or is it because of someone else? Mm-hmm. And then this why, we love talking about guiding principles and convictions. Why? Why are those choices your choices if we're sticking with the black and white? Mm-hmm. But honestly... I'm a fan of spectrums. Yes. I was waiting for you to say that word. And so yeah. it, you know, it brings me great joy. That's why I wrapped it up at the end. <laughs> a little cherry on top. All right. So the so are there obviously there's a this spectrum of failure and a spectrum of success on opposite sides of the coin. But then John, you talked about how defining these two different things can be and are they close are they more closely related than not? I guess is my question. Could your success be a failure and a failure be a success if you define it in such black and white terms? You know, like I just wonder if it's just too much of a, I don't know, like unachievable thing sometimes or like the, the words kind of blended together because they could be a success on one end, but then failure depend upon somebody else, like a relationship. So like, so I know that I'm really convoluting on what I'm saying here, but like it's almost like I think like, okay, success for me and this is a win for me. But what we've learned from the leadership of this podcast and go back and listen to extraordinary relationships and a lot of different pieces, parts, because it's a success for me, it could mean failure for somebody else because they see me a certain way and they may in turn say, okay, well, they wouldn't say this out loud, but subconsciously bring us to a different level where we wouldn't see it as a success. Does that make sense, gentlemen? Like I'm succeeding and I'm changing the way that I am, but you're seeing that and saying, no, change back. I see that as a failure. I'm going to tell you it's a failure, even though I see you moving differently. Yeah. My first thought when you're discussing this is the, the objective subjective portions of it. Mm -hmm. If I set up these objective standards, yes, I might fail. Yes. I might not have gotten an A. Yes. I might not have, um, gotten the job, gotten this project done on budget, under budget or on time or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so Mm. objectively that could be a failure, but subjectively, um, and this is where I think that fears tie in. I think we can tend to define failure very closely with what we fear will happen. I think that's a a possibility, but when we look at failure subjectively, 
maybe I didn't get the A. Maybe I didn't get the project in on time and under budget, but can I do better next time? Am I going to reflect and gain a better perspective on why hmm. the things happened that did such that with what's in my control, yeah. next time, should there ever be a next time, I'll do better. Yeah, I think about in the education world, and I know some of our listeners are in education, the difference between a summative and a formative assessment. Can I talk pedagogy for a few minutes? <laughs> I love the word. Yes. Um, you know, summative assessment is that AP exam score or final exam score where there's a final test and you pass or fail or get a B or C or something like that. And then, Zach, you mentioned the idea of... Um, the nuances to that of a formative assessment is something that a teacher does partway through the course or even in a class period that gives them information. And from there they can adjust their instruction. And so I think um, f failure to me is something as simple as I do a particular action, then I see an outcome. But rarely is it final. Like rarely is it, there's always something I can learn from it and get better at. And then the next time something similar goes around, perhaps I increase my chances of being quote unquote successful. So I think it's a growth journey, hmm. not necessarily a one and done decision. So is it a, is it interplay between the emotional versus rational world? As we talk about emotional rational world on this podcast. So your rational world is above the iceberg and then your emotional world is below the iceberg. And so the emotional world guides that rational world. Um, you know, as you guys were talking, the failure could be a, the failure could be a rational world thing. Like I failed at the project, but then you were talking about perspective. And if you have take a more thoughtful outlook on it or emotional outlook on it, how you deal emotionally with that failure then can guide whether you have perspective about it for next time or it could crash you down. Right. Yeah, it could break you. It could be the floods that pull your feet out from under you. And I think it's important that when you're watching, when, when you're evaluating yourself like that, you make sure to, um, especially if you're in fast-paced environments, there's an opportunity to reflect mostly on the negatives and not on the successes. I know that I, I hear that criticism sometimes. Oh, we don't ever take the time to reflect on when we've succeeded and when we've done well. And I think that's that's a result of um, often anxious systems, I would say, because the idea is we're defining our successes by not failing, and so let's just keep not failing. Hmm. So um, there's a book called How to Be an Adult in Relationships by uh, David Ricco, Richo, R-I-C-H-O. Anyways, and he talks a little bit about this failure stuff here um, in this quote, and I want to, want to hear what you have to say about it specifically off of what you just said. He said, in healthy families, there is struggle and assistance when necessary, not frustration and shame about failure. So I'll read that over again. In healthy families, there is struggle and assistance when, when, when necessary. So struggle and assistance when necessary, not frustration and shame about failure. So it's like those two sides of the coin, shame and frustration, which is what I heard you talking about. You know, we're frustrated about this, and I'm like going to keep thinking over and over and over again about this failure. While on the other side of it is getting assistance and struggle like through that. Um, he was talking about a family here, but our systems, you know, uh, we have a family system, but you also have a work system. And I believe that would probably bleed over to the other portions. And so what do you guys think about that quote? Well, I like the struggle uh, assistance, which suggests ongoing battle. That's when I think of struggle and assistance. I think of that the the war is going on continually but the the other words of frustration and, and shame sound to me like a final verdict hmm. like i've passed judgment on you at this and the book's closed so i, I think it's a helpful s separation between a continuing story and a final verdict and hmm. i think that's helpful to think that way it's interesting that uh, off of what you're saying, John, you just need to broaden your perspective. You don't ever want to look at it and say, this is the one decision that I'm going to define as impactful overall. You got to remember that there's always those choices after 
There's choices lead to leading up to, and there's the choices that you've already made. And so you have all this wealth of information, and so you can pull out the facts. And that quote's interesting is because you're, you have other people that are providing assistance, but in that they're providing perspective. Mm-hmm. They're giving you, they're helping to keep you. If you're you're doing a good job of keeping those people around because you have control of who's in your life, if if you keep people who are going to add valuable perspective to your life to keep you from, I don't know, digging digging your head into the ground like an ostrich. I don't mm-hmm. know what's yeah, a good, what's a good a metaphor. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, burying your eggs in a sand dune. I, I don't. But <laughs> if, if you have people who are providing good perspective to you, that that can help to keep that perspective broad and to keep it from being oh my goodness, I'm going to live in this crippling fear of making this wrong, this failure choice mm-hmm. that's going to dot, 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 end my life. Over and over my again. Life. Yeah. Yeah, like a, like a dog returning to its vomit. I will continually go back to this. Yeah. And that's a really scary thought for a lot of people. That can be a scary thing to think that I'm stuck here within this failure and I'm going to keep doing it. Um, So I wrote down some questions that I think are good ways to add perspective when you're evaluating decisions and choices and because I think that's the context that we're currently talking about failure. But the the two big ones that I came to was to what outcome am I tied? And then also who's setting the standards of which I'm trying to meet? You know, who's the standard maker? Um, and I, I feel as if there should be this, this subsequent question of how can I untangle these things that I fuse together, whether like what is fused together that doesn't need to be maybe how, why am I tied to a particular outcome and pleasing a certain person or, you know, something along those lines. We talked a, a podcast a while ago about perfectionism, mm-hmm. and I think about that idea of tied to outcome that I, I think effective leaders uh, realize that their efforts can lead to the outcome more likely happening, but I think we get in trouble when we try to say, this is what I'm going to do, and then this is the outcome I want, and if I don't get that outcome, I failed, or I'm a failure. Mm. And I think faithfulness and perseverance is something to cultivate. And the outcome may or may not be what we want, but I think that's part of the growth process. Yeah, I just think about the tight-fistedness of that outcome. You're so tight, tightly wound up on getting that outcome. And then it doesn't, you know, even if, let's say, you got 99% of the outcome, it could still be seen as a failure you're so on that target of what's going on and that does lead into perfectionism that we talked about and, and I think true to uh, a connected concept we've talked about solid self versus a pseudo self um, so pseudo self is someone who borrows f- the ideas and thoughts of other people and so if I have an outcome that I really really want and I achieve that outcome but I'm doing so just to make me feel better it's likely that we're going to feel hollow, that it's not going to quite fill our self because our self is essentially empty if we don't really have a solid self that we've built. So be careful what you wish for, they say, because you might get that outcome, but realize that the achievement of that is pretty hollow. Hmm. So are you fused to the outcome then? You're, you're fused to something. Yeah. You might be fused to a goal that you want to accomplish. Like, I really want to do this and and you're going to strive and work for that. I don't know. I'm thinking out loud here. Maybe you're either fused to your goal or you're fused to your outcome. You're fused to one of the two of those. Do you think that's true? Hmm. Um, So how are we going to define goal and outcome then? So the goal is like you write out your goal and this is what I want. The outcome is like the, the final piece, right? Yeah. So if my goal was, you know, I don't know, I want to be able to get a promotion of some kind. Um, I'm going to do all the things I can to get that promotion. So mm-hmm. maybe it's go back to school. Maybe it's take on these tasks of volunteer opportunities, whatever it might be, realizing that ultimately 
there's many constituencies that are involved in making this decision. And it's not black and white or one plus one equals two. Yeah. Being fused to a goal is, doggone, if I don't get this promotion, I'm going to be so hacked. And and when I don't get it, I'm going to be mad at so-and-so and and talk about politics. Mm -hmm. So I think the first one's a healthy fusion. And the second one is unhealthy. The the, the goal. The goal itself. Goal fusion is okay. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud here. I never thought of it this way, but. Yeah. What do you guys think? Yeah. It's like, I. When I was talking to my students, I was talking about how, you know, can you look at your goal and then say, am I okay with not getting the final outcome of this goal? Am I going to be okay with getting a different outcome? And what does that do to you when you say that you can do that? You know, so I even shared with them, like, I, like, I deely want to get married, like, one day. That's, that's a goal of mine. But, like, I, I can't be fused to that outcome. Because then what is my, my worth come from that? Do I lose worth because I'm not married? No. You know, that, that can really be harmful to myself, even though it's hurtful, even to even think about like, I'll, I'll never be married. Like that kind of makes me sad inside. But at the same time, I mean, how much more wrapped up would I be into that outcome if, if I'm just so fused to it and think that my, you know, whether I'm worthy or not, I don't know. Um, I mean, that's a deep one, but like, you know, I'm talking to students that are like, I just want to get an A on this test, you know, like, why are you talking to me about, you know, getting married? But I think it's tied to this, you know, they're just not at that point, but it's tied to a a similar failure. There's a connection there that's, that's similar. Um, Yes, there's a little bit more black and white because, well, maybe not. I mean, grades still take relationships with your teachers and other people around you and projects and stuff. Um, So I don't know, Zach, you look ponder some I'm just trying to think through this as uh, I'm also trying to keep in mind um, a system of people um, working towards a goal so you know what does failure look like um, what does a, a failure of leadership look like in one of those mm. systems or organizations so when I ha- and I think it ties in because there are some things that you need to do like as a student, if your goal is to pass this test, like there are some things you're going to need to do that you can't just get around. You're going to have to crack open a textbook. You're going to have to do notes. You're going to have to probably attend class. You know, mm-hmm. there are some things, but it does help to have a relationship with the teacher to be able to ask questions and to, and so in the other sphere, you know, we have deadlines that we need to meet. We have to work with certain people. We have to financially be in the black over a period of time so that we can sustainably keep going. So there are these hard objectives, but if we say, well, what happens if I don't meet that? Uh, I think that offers the opportunity for you to remember your other guiding principles and convictions Hmm. such that you remember that it's not a tunnel vision situation. You don't, you're not solely striving to get married. You're not solely striving for A's. You're not so. You are a person in many different systems with many different aspirations and goals and convictions. And so when I say, well, what if I don't get married? Uh, it's like, well, I actually do have some hobbies that I'd like to foster. Or, you know, my relationship with the family I have now is very important to me and I want to make sure that I don't lose that. And so I'm going to steward those relationships well. And I I think that plays a part in it. And so I, I, I don't really have a conclusion to this. This is just there, there's some sort of balance that needs to be struck with. There are things that need to be done. There are relationships that need to be managed. And then there's your personal self Mm -hmm. when you want to know what is and not get caught up in that emotional current. So there's a question that I posed earlier uh, before we did the podcast is how do we have less failure? Now that question sounds kind of funny just off the, off the get go here. How do you have less failure? My question to post to you is, can you have less? Can you increase your chance for success, but still one hand say that I'm trying my best, but on the other hand saying I'm still up to up for failure. Is there a way that you can increase the amount of success that you could have? That's my question. I think in the rational world, 
uh, the answer that answer is a simple yes. So, looking at what went wrong before and trying to to fix that and get better at it. Uh, I can think of the Cleveland Browns who have had failure for quite some time, yet they got a what seems like a general manager that people believe in and has made some good choices regarding draft picks and learned from failure and just made better decisions based on previous mistakes. So yeah, I think you can't have less failure by, it sounds trite, but learning from your mistakes and saying, "Hmm, I should probably do that different and the outcome tends to be better. Does that including like... I'm thinking about group, you know, you're the leader of whatever group and whatever system you're in. Is there a way that you can, you know, work with other people to make that success more achievable? Because whether you're family or whether, whether you're at work or wherever you're at, I mean, your goal, you you don't want to fail. I mean, it's not where you're not. (laughs) So like, how do you reduce that amount? What does that look like? What are some things, some tangible things non-rational things because I think as Zach kind of stated earlier, he talked about goal success, like how you can do goal things. I strongly believe, you know, as long as you have the the mental faculties, you can do, you can learn all the rational stuff you want to. If you wanted to take a, get a certain job, you could study your butt off and get to where you need to, but there's a big missing piece of this and that's the emotional world. So how can we, manage that emotional world to reduce the amount of failure probability and increase the amount of success? What does that look like? I keep coming back to the idea of fostering a a sense of responsibility Hmm. uh, when it also ties into this who piece of, you know, who's setting the standards, who am I trying to please, who, what outcome am I, 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 when we, we take it outside of ourselves to some degree we lose control. And so there's the the objective world where we say, well, this isn't entirely within my control, but this is the standard we're trying to hit. You know, you're making the test and I'm trying to pass it. And that's just a reality I have to live with. But fostering that sense of responsibility and saying, well, regardless of what he puts on the test, there's a set of knowledge that I have to know and I have to be aware of. You know, I can't, constantly blame other people because I'm not in control of those other people. Am I saying that I'm subject to my system? Am I saying that I'm subject? And I think that ties into the emotions of it. You know, at what point am I letting my emotions create an outlook that I am only setting standards that I can fail? Wait, aren't you subject to your system though? You are. But are you subject? Do you have any power of your own within that system? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that I am the, you know, are are you out in the middle of the ocean or are you in a little boat with a paddle, Mm -hmm. you know? With a tiger. Yeah, with a tiger. Life of pie. Life of pie, yeah. Because that makes sense. Totally (laughs) seen that movie. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I don't know if that, that struck a chord at all. Just... The idea that when you get caught up in the emotions of it, this subjective, emotional, non-rational side, there's the a what chi- ifs and the, the, yeah, yeah, you start defining your successes by things that are outside of your control, and by regaining hmm. a small sense of per- starting with potentially personal responsibility, you know, regardless of what else happens, regardless of what's put on that test, regardless of when this deadline is, these are the things that I need to do. It's my responsibility to do them. And so I'm going to do them. And so pull that little piece out of the emotion uh, of that emotional realm and then go from there. And on the other end is now I have to connect with other people and it, and with the responsibility part is I'm responsible to you and not for you. That's the other side of it too. Like, okay, what are my responsibilities and what are the other people's around me? What are their responsibilities? And so I'm still responsible for what's happening, especially as a leader. I'm responsible for what's happening in this system overall. But at the same time, I'm not, you know, I need to be responsible to these people, but I'm not responsible for what they're doing 
because they're each individual person. And John, you've talked a lot, a lot about that too in the past. So yeah, I was thinking, you know, you mentioned about extraordinary relationships and Roberta Gilbert defines those as relationships that are separate, equal, and open. And I mentioned in answer to your question earlier about how do you reduce the likelihood of failure? And one I said was the rational world getting some of that stuff right. But there's also the relational component that in many cases you mentioned about a team or a group that you're part of, that it's a shared responsibility. And if I can treat people in those ways, then it increases the likelihood that they'll feel validated and they'll become a bit more open. And then whatever vision or thought that I have, they're just more open to buy into that. And then we'll be rowing increased likelihood in the same direction, which helps with accomplishing goals and not having failure. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you guys think this, this comes to a point to where when we talk about this failure thing, this rational world, there's, there's gotta be a point to where you reach the top of your game on the rational world. Right. And then you still aren't hitting the mark. Is that, that's gotta be true, right? Ed Friedman in failure of nerve talks about imbibing with data. And I think that there's a piece of that where you can mine all the data you want. You can read all the research articles you want uh, in the economics terms, diminishing marginal returns. Um, you can only go so far with rational world competency. It leaves the entire emotional sphere un underneath completely un untapped. And yeah, I think you can max out in the rational world. Yeah. It's kind of like the, <laughs> it's like the marriage therapist who's been divorced like five times, right? He, re he or she really <laughs> knows their stuff, yeah, yeah. but they don't really even follow it in sure. the emotional world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is, uh, yeah, and that happens in so many different areas of, of life and systems. Um, and sometimes, <laughs> just thinking like those people, especially the people who know everything that's going on, it's just like, those are the people that drive me the most nuts sometimes too. And I know some of us around are like, you're saying this thing, and it, you know, it makes me think of like a hypocritical thing, system, but like, in some ways it is. Um, and so, you can really rub people the wrong way. Well, any other thoughts before we go wrappy wrap? Yeah. Uh, a continued answer to this question, how can we reduce failure? I think we can also reduce the stigma of failure. Mm. If it's so undesirable that it creates an anxious system, people aren't going to be performing optimally. We know how this just anxiety can bleed out into the system, and it definitely has effects. So if we can set clear expectations um, interpersonally. You know, this is how I need things communicated to me. This is how I want to be treated. You know, thank you. I appreciate you. All that warm, gushy stuff, <laughs> you know. But if we can, if we can create as, you know, leaders of our little spheres, whether that's from a triangle perspective or whether you're hierarchically at the top saying, you know, this is what failure looks like. And this is clearly, as clearly as I can define it, what will happen if we fail. So you don't have to worry about, you know, maybe in a business sphere, layoffs. Or maybe clearly saying, yes, layoffs are a potential. And, you know, just taking a lot of those what ifs out of the situation of, as you can. Um, even interpersonally saying, you know, this is how I feel or what I'm thinking and... Now you don't have that what if to think about. And I've clearly, I think we can do a good job of that to reduce the mm -hmm. uh, chances of failure as well. Yeah, I like that the idea of a, of a leader, even maybe the first time they stand before a group that they now are working with to, you know, John uh, Engels in, in one of his writings, uh, he, he writes for the leadership coaching blog, but he talks about appropriate vulnerability you know, as a leader sharing a time where you aimed here and, and, and you missed the mark, just to let your followers know, if you will, that failure sometimes happens, but we're going to dream big, we're going to risk big, and we might fall short, but we're just going to get up and keep trying, and I believe in you, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that helps the followers, if you will, think, well, failure's not the end all, so it can encourage risk-taking. I think there's shared leadership. There's some shared ownership you can have in that too, where you get other people's voices involved and they can have, take their own ownership of what's going on with the whole system 
as soon as they have some skin in the game, then you can help each other, especially when we go back to David uh, Rico, Riccio, whatever his <laughs> quote is. Uh, I'm sorry, David, um, about struggle and assistance. That's the assistance part, because if we are in it together, then we can assist each other through the struggle and instead mm-hmm. of just one person. I'm the one I'm the only one that failed. And now who do I go to? And that's a really hard space to be in. So, but as a leader or even as a follower, trying to take some extra responsibility, taking some ownership of whatever's going on. Once you get that skin in the game, then, then things kind of r- ramp up a little bit here, but now you notice you have more friends, you know, you can connect with people a little bit easier too. That's that shared goal. that's put together usually by a leader. That's usually helpful expectations, all that. All right. So to wrap this up, failure, first off, it has to do with success, right? Failing or success, different t- sides of the coin, but it is not black and white issue. It's more on a spectrum, as Zach would say. And then what are the things can we say to wrap it up? If, if you're going to do something with it right now that we know that, like, how could we how do you deal with it? I've, we've said several different things. Zach, what would you say if somebody asked you a question about failure and, and I'm really trying to figure this whole failure thing out. How do I deal with this as a leader or a follower? I would start with answering the question of what what would it mean to succeed? And then looking at that from a higher place and saying, am I tied to this? And then just sort of go from there. Hmm. Why am I tied to this? Who's tying me to this? And, you know, gain some perspective, maybe even, you know, set some expectations. You know, this is what it means to succeed and this is what I envision it looks like to succeed. You know, maybe set some goalposts or something along those lines. Hmm. Yeah, I, I guess I'd ask the person, what what is the outcome you were hoping for? And they might state that and say, OK, so tell me who made that decision or what group of people made that decision and you get that question answered. And then the next question is what factors do you think went into making this decision? Trying to get them to realize that there's multiple factors that go into an outcome and their ability to focus on themselves is a limited part of that, but there are other constituents and things that factor in and then realizing what falls in the control and what falls outside of the control. So I think of inputs versus outputs Mm. that being faithful and looking at uh, what I can control and focusing on that and realizing that failure is not final. Mm -hmm. Are you okay with that outcome not coming to, you know, exactly the way you think of it? Are you okay with that? That's a hard question to answer, but hopefully, and and I I hope those people are listening that you have somebody you can talk to about that. Um, And that's why, you know, John does coaching and eventually of leadership to do coaching. And that these are, these are the type of questions that are really can be really helpful to talk, to dialogue with somebody about. And so, um, with that, I think we're going to wrap up. Yes. Yeah. So, um, thanks for joining us about with failure, by the way. Uh, if you have any questions, you can direct them to our email, which is mm, John. I forgot the of podcast, the of podcast at gmail.com. And you can listen to us on iTunes, Simplecast, Google Play, YouTube's. We're on the Facebook. Yeah, we're 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 pretty much everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And eventually, actually, maybe even by the next time we have a podcast out, a website will be soon coming up with a rebranding. We keep like you know teasing this teasing out, it but it's eventually going to happen one yeah. of these days. So, in final production, in final production, new logo, new website. Click the. The uh, little button that says subscribe my email and suddenly we're just blasting you with <laughs> daily emails. We're in your spam folder, uh-huh. we're in your deleted items folder, we're in your inbox. You just can't get rid of us. Yep, and we got lots of lots of different um, gear you could get, like soda koozies mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. combs. I you heard know, that, that gonna, was on We're going to monetize this, and the way to monetize this is with apparel. That's just the way it is. Iron on pockets, That's that's my big idea. <laughs> At first, I had no. You said iron on pockets. I was literally thinking of iron. Mm, yeah, you yeah. Know, but no, you put the now. Is that pants on or pa- pants off when you put iron? Why um, do I assume it's on the pants? I'm not sure. Depends why. on whether one of your goals is pain tolerance. <laughs> <laughs> My outcome is that I won't have any. All right, none. Nerves yeah. just dead. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> um, Thanks to Jesse Huffstetler or Jetler for our sick beats. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And thanks for listening. And we will catch you next time. I am Alex. I'm John. And I'm Zach. And we'll see you. Adios. See you around. <laughs>